My task this morning is to talk about uh, systemic opioid pharmacotherapy. And um, I think all of you who are current fellows received uh, two reviews that I had the privilege of writing in the last year, one on cancer pain, which just came out in a, in a preprint of a book chapter in the textbook of substance abuse. So the, the former is focused on opioid therapy in the medically ill, and the latter is focused on opioid therapy <coughs> in chronic non-cancer pain patients, including those with known sub substance use disorders. So my feeling was that to come and do a PowerPoint presentation on the material that is eloquently explicated in two publications that you can read at your leisure didn't make any sense. So in the, uh, in, in, a, in the hope that we can have a bit of a dialogue and actually uh, create some messages that stick in your brain. Even early in the morning, we're not going to do slides. And instead, we're going to talk quickly about the key take-home messages on the elements of what I would call optimizing the pharmacological outcomes of opioid therapy. So I've been teaching opioid therapy since the, mid the early 80s. And for the first 20 years, we never talked about risk. We only talked about pharmacological uh, management in terms of analgesia, side effects, and function as outcomes that were desirable, but we never talked about risk. In the last six or eight years, there's been a sea change in the way opioid therapy is perceived, and even in my review on cancer pain for The Lancet, I um, included a table on uh, strategies for risk assessment and management when treating cancer pain using opioids. And that represents a huge change in how to teach this. So what I have come to do in recent years is actually divide, divide the topic up and talk about risk assessment and management in one context and then talk about optimizing pharmac pharmacological outcomes in other contexts. And again, for those of you who are fellows, uh, I had a, we had the opportunity to talk about risk with the family medicine residents just recently, so I'm not going to focus on that today. But this is in no way to minimize the importance of risk in every aspect of therapy, meaning to say the decision to position the drug for a therapeutic trial, the decision to uh, select a specific drug, the decision to use a breakthrough pain medication, the decision to dose, how to monitor patients are all based on the concept of risk stratifying in terms of risk of outcomes associated with abuse, addiction, diversion, and unintentional overdose, and then making judgments that optimize safety by minimizing risk based on the risk stratification. So this is, this is everything we're going to talk about in the next 45 minutes does not diminish the importance of that. It complements it. And if you all have any questions about how to bring it together, we'll have another session about it because it's, a, it's a absolutely a key element, particularly in pain management. Palliative care, uh, it's becoming more and more key because of the role that palliative care docs are playing in institutions and also because of the role that palliative care docs are playing in the cancer survivor population. So the cancer survivor population is growing very rapidly. Early studies suggest very high rates of chronic pain. Those patients are often being referred to either pain specialists or palliative care specialists. And the issues for those patients are not the issues for patients who are bed-bound at end of life. They're the issues for patients who are trying to function normally. So it's exactly the same set of issues. Okay, so we're not going to talk about risk assessment and management. We're going to talk about the elements of optimizing the analgesic outcomes, minimizing the side effects, ending up with the best therapeutic outcomes, uh, in relation to pain control, uh, overall quality of life, and function. So you could say that the, that the key elements of this are positioning the therapy, selecting the drug, selecting the route, selecting the dose, titrating the dose, managing the side effects, and monitoring outcomes. And I would suggest to you that this is an iterative process because it is common for therapy not to work. Uh, it's common for therapy to have a negative outcome of one type or another along the way, and then your goal would be to decide what to do next. And in some cases, that's to stay with opioids and change them. In some cases, it's to manage a side effect more effectively. In some cases, it's to get the patient off the drug. Okay, so key take-home message for positioning therapy. In the United States in 2011, 
there are a very large number of treatment strategies that can be considered for a patient who comes to you with acute or prolonged pain and your job will be to develop a reasonable plan of care within the conventional standard of care based on the assessment of that patient. So opioid therapy is one therapy among a very large number and the question is what is the clinical scenario that would have you position this therapy as the first line? What are the clinical issues that would have you put the therapy down at the bottom of the list? And again, these are individual decisions, but there are broad strategies so that if you ever, for example, had to defend your decision to a review board or a court, you'd be able to say, well, my decision to consider opioids in this situation was based on the standard of care that says something. So you have to be able to articulate what that standard of care is. So usually, as you know, in pain management, we talk about the context of acute pain and chronic non-cancer pain, which is a misnomer, but it's what we have, and then uh, chronic pain related to medical illness, including cancer. But it's actually, that those categories are very, very broad. Acute pain can be acute post-operative pain in a monitored setting. It can be acute post-traumatic pain in an ED. It can be acute pain in a dentist's office. It can be acute pain in a, pr a primary care uh, office. It can be acute pain with an ex expected time course of three months or acute pain with an expected time course of three days. So acute pain is not monolithic and positioning opioids relative to the context of acute pain is not automatic. But having said that, what's the standard of care internationally in when one talks about acute pain and opioids? How would you position opioid therapy for acute pain? By position, I mean, would it be the first thing you consider? Would it be the first thing you consider in a certain, uh, if a certain criterion is met? Or would it be something you'd consider after something else is done? So Kayvon said after something else is done, you said first line. So it's good we have a consensus. <laughs> um, and that's the nature of the game. So if you're in trouble and he's the witness for the U.S. attorney, you're in trouble. When, to what population does the who ladder? Does everybody know what the who ladder is? First of all, don't say who. I hate the word who. It's not who. It's WHO or World Health Organization. <laughs> People who say the who ladder, just they, I, I shut down. I can't talk to them for like an hour. So don't say the who ladder. It's not who. It's an immense organization. You know, it, so it's the WHO ladder. Does everybody know what the WHO ladder is? Yeah? Okay. So the WHO ladder was a, a very important event in the history of humankind. Uh, and it was uh, created by an expert panel. My, my uh, co-chief uh, of the pain service at, at Sloan, uh, Kathy Foley, chaired that panel in the early 80s. It, was, it comprised um, experts of different level of competency from around the world. It needed to have international representation. And they got together in a room and they talked about things and then they chose to create the WHO ladder without reference to any evidence based on pharmacology that uh, was very, had very limited uh, information, but it was very little known about the pharmacology of opioid drugs. And so the WHO ladder uh, was, is, is now perceived as being a very important communication and political tool, but not a tool to be considered for a guideline in managing, number one. Number two, and this is the most important thing, um, and I'm only torturing you because I hear it all the time and you happen to be sitting in front of me. The, w the WHO ladder was designed for patients with cancer and in the context of international cancer control, the vast majority of people who present to doctors with cancer pain have advanced illness. So as that, as that panel <laughs> talked about what's our strategy for cancer pain control, they chose aspirin, codeine, and morphine not because those were the best drugs but because those were the drugs available in most countries. They chose morphine not because it had established better efficacy or effectiveness, but because it had been used and 
uh, and uh, in countries that could that were willing to in, um, increase access to morphine, it was cheap. And, uh, and they were specifically talking about cancer pain, particularly in the context of advanced illness. <coughs> so, if you ever get asked, for example, in a court of law, why did you select an opioid for this patient with acute pain? And you go, well, the who ladder. <laughs> First of all, the judge is going to stand up and say, don't call it the who ladder. <laughs> it's not who. It's World Health Organization or WHO. And then the judge is going to say, uh, but doctor, wasn't that uh, ladder developed uh, by an expert panel to talk about pain control in patients with advanced cancer? And you'd say yes. And the judge would say, well, what's the evidence base for translating that to positioning therapy for acute pain? And you would say, <laughs> okay. But having said that, Dr. Mayu said, first line for acute pain, ED experience, right? ED experience. Not PCP in the office experience. Not dentist experience. You get the challenge here. So I don't want to belabor this. Let's just say the following. There is an international acceptance of the concept that for acute severe pain, acute moderate to severe pain, an opioid drug should be considered first line unless some other therapy with a, with a similar or better therapeutic index is available. But that, of course, doesn't mean that it gets implemented or would necessarily be appropriate. If you have a 90-year-old with a gait disorder and mild cognitive impairment who comes in with an acute severe pain, you might opt to try Tylenol before you'd consider trying an opioid someone with comorbid psychiatric pathology like a substance use disorder, you might decide to position it very low, even in the context of acute pain, because you can't con control it. For acute pain in the hospital setting where you can monitor it, you might decide to say it doesn't matter about the patient's psychiatric comorbidity. It's monitored. We have it under control. I'm going to use an opioid. So the general context is for acute, moderate to severe pain for which there is no other reasonable therapy, opioids are first line, with provisos. What about the context of serious or life-threatening active medical illness, like metastatic disease, uh, advanced AIDS, cirrhosis, and stage renal disease? What's the international consensus for where you would position opioid therapy for patients with moderate to severe chronic pain, moderate to severe persistent pain. First line, last line, middle line, line about two-thirds of the way to the top, First line, line about a third of the way from the bottom. <laughs> what? Yeah, so, so the worldwide consensus, and this I think is quite protective. In fact, I would even grab the legal, the, the term that the lawyers love to say and say this is a safe harbor concept the safe harbor concept for doctors. The safe harbor is that if a patient has active, serious, or life-threatening illness, there is an international consensus that for chronic pain, opioids should be considered the first-line approach. Doesn't mean everybody gets them, because you may risk stratify to feel it's too risky. It just means that you are in a standard of care that should give you comfort about making that decision. Now, what about for patients with chronic, so-called chronic non-cancer pain. Somebody presents to the office with um, six months of low back pain. Somebody presents to the office with 10 years of fibromyalgia. Somebody presents to the office with four months of post neuralgia. Obviously very different people. How do you think about opioids in that context? First line, last line. Ur less urgently indicated. So, so urgent, urgent to me is a time issue, so not a positioning second issue. One. Second, okay. So the international, I, I think um, that's probably more specific because it, it implies that there's something you'll try. If it doesn't work, you go to an opioid. Right. That's not how the standard of care is conceptualized, but I, I hear you. It's just not how it's thought about. 
So the way that the way I participated in a very interesting international consensus conference to develop guidelines for the treatment of neuropathic pain, which were published in Pain uh, two years ago, and we had a big argument about how to position opioids for persistent neuropathic pain. Big argument. And it was so interesting because the physicians from the countries with the most liberal regulation was, were the most negative on sanctioning opioid therapy early for neuropathic pain. And um, so we duked it out and it was, it was a very good discussion. And if you read the guidelines, you'll probably feel that we punted because we did. So the bottom line is that opioid therapy is not the first line therapy for chronic non-cancer pain of any type. However, as, ex as expressed in the guideline for neuropathic pain, if there is a perceived value in starting opioids early because of the severity of the pain or its consequences, with the expectation that other therapies will be introduced in the hope that the opioid therapy can be eliminated, that would be part of the accepted guideline or accepted standard of care. So the bottom line is other things are considered first because of the concern about long-term effectiveness and risk. However, and where you position it compared to other things is totally a judgment call. If the person has moderate to severe persistent pain, it, it at least is considered even from the start, but you wouldn't start with that drug as part of the standard of care. You consider other things first, with the only proviso being that if the pain is severe or has significant adverse consequences, you can, in a dialogue with the patient, start an opioid drug with the intention of providing some rapid control so that you can use that as a jumping off point for other therapies that may take longer to kick in. This sort of explicit communication with the patient is what you should be documenting. It's very helpful to document it. You know, let's just say worst case scenario, again, I'll use the medical, I'm, I'm not a big one to focus on medical legal risks, however, they're real world stuff and so sometimes I use them just at this time of day just to make sure everybody stays away. So let's just say for the sake of argument you get sued by somebody who says you addicted them. I'm asked a couple of times a year to consult on that kind of case. I've never done it and never will but I know these cases are out there because lawyers are asking me if I'm willing to consult on them. So suppose you, uh, you get sued for having addicted a patient and if your notes show that you have decided to take a patient reporting severe pain and functional impairment on an opioid drug early with the expectation expressed to the patient that you'll be trying other things because the patient's risk of opioid therapy may be relatively high. So your intention is that, is that this is not a trial for long-term therapy but rather an interim step and you document that, that puts you in that much more solid ground than a chart that suggests that sort of thoughtlessly patient comes in with chronic pain irrespective of risk you started opioids early okay so those those are the those are the kinds of that's the framework I like you to think about it in it's far more liberal than most physicians in the United States it's far more liberal than what most countries do it's far more liberal than many countries that don't have access to opioid drugs in the out, outpatient setting but it also is a framework within which um, the need to, to get more refined in your thinking, more critical, and to document is very high. So it's just a very broad framework. Yeah. When you talk about risk, how do you assess that? You're talking about risk in terms of the risk of abuse, addiction, and diversion? If that's what you, if that's what yeah. you mean by risk, assessing the risk. So just to take a quick detour to talk about risk for a second. So the concept nowadays is that every patient who is being considered for long-term opioid therapy should have that therapy initiated as a trial, number one. This is chronic non-cancer pain as a trial, explicitly. And, the tr and even this is patients who have been on an opioid for a while because you started it as an interim step or some other physician started it as an interim step and now it looks like they're benefiting and so you say, I'm going to continue this. But in the process of continuing it, you can conceptualize the initial period as a trial in which you're going to monitor outcomes. The decision making in that trial is based on risk stratification and the, and the risk stratification first focuses on the risk of responsible drug, the risk of irresponsible drug use or, or problematic drug use or non-adherence behavior. 
So the risk of non-adherence <laughs> behavior for some docs is assessed with a tool because there are about 12 of them out there now. For most docs, like myself, the risk of non-adherence behavior would be assessed by, by a personal or family history of alcohol or drug abuse, any major psychiatric pathology. Those are the, those are the two most important things. And, um, and then there are other factors. For example, younger age is more, carries more risk than older age. Uh, patients who, have, who smoke carry more risk than patients who don't smoke. Uh, patients who had a history of multiple automobile accidents carry more risk than patients who don't. So the key, the key factors to think about would be personal or family risk of um, alcohol abuse or substance abuse and uh, major psychiatric pathology of any type, axis one or axis two. Which means, of course, that your chart has to reflect the fact that you asked about a family history of substance abuse. And it's amazing what you get. I, I saw a patient in consultation last week who has been on opioid therapy for um, seven, eight years, uh, stable, no history of problems. I said to her, have you ever had problems with your drugs? Have you ever taken more than prescribed, gone to other doctors? Uh, in any way, um, give your doctor pause, uh, cause for concern. And she and her partner said, no way, you know, I'm totally, I, I'm not into that. And then I said to her, um, do you drink? And she said, not anymore. But I was a pretty heavy drinker in my, in my youth, in my 20s. But then I stopped and I haven't drunk at all since I've been on opioids. And I, so, I, so I had a little red flag and said, try to drill down into her 20s. You know, did you ever need treatment? Did you have a blackout? Did you ever, did it? And, and then I, I would, I would sometimes give the cage in that setting, sometimes not. But she was so, um, she was 60 years old, so, so much of an indicator of being a responsible drug user with a long history and a confirmatory family member right there, I felt comfortable. So then I said, well, what about your family? Any issues with drugs in your family? And she rolled her eyes. She said, well, I got one brother who's a polysubstance abuser, both a drug addict and an alcoholic. He finally cleaned up his act last year. I got another brother who's just an alcoholic, and my father and my grandfather are alcoholic. So she did not offer that. I mean, even though I was pushing her about her own history, she just, it just didn't come until I asked her specifically. So she would be stratified into high risk. The other component of risk assessment is, is the medical piece that you'd be doing all the time. So someone who's elderly, has unstable gait, <laughs> is cognitively impaired, uh, somebody who, um, uh, who may have uh, in, uh, um, intrinsic bowel disease. Uh, these are patients you have to worry, obviously, that the side effects of opioids are going to produce significant problems. Okay, so this is the positioning of therapy. Let's talk about selecting the drug. So you're, you have a patient with chronic non-cancer pain who comes to the pain clinic and, believe it or not, is not taking an opioid, at least a prescribed opioid. It happens. You might see it someday. So what's, what drug would you give her to, if it's, and again, this is chronic pain. This is a patient, for example, who has post-herpetic neuralgia. And the patient has been given trials of pregabalin, gabapentin, duloxetine, nortriptyline, mixilatine, and IV lidocaine, and the lidoderm patch, and some weird concoction that she picked up in a health food store. And one year after this, she's got severe pain from a T6 to T8 PHN. And so finally, she gets referred to the expert who, for the sake of argument, will say is you. <laughs> and you say, well, you got a lot of pain. Anybody with moderate to severe chronic pain would at least be considered for an opioid drug. The guidelines would say that I have to think that there, is there anything else that I could try now that would have a, an equal or better therapeutic index? Uh, if I risk stratify this patient, is she at high risk or low risk of abuse, diversion, uh, or unintentional overdose? Well, it looks like it might be reasonable in this case. So you say to the patient and family, you know, I'm surprised that no one gave you an opioid. And she said, as people have said to me, no one ever suggested it. So what, what opioid do you give her? Intrathecal morphine? 
choice. <laughs> Would you give her OTFC, Actic, a rapid onset fentanyl formulation? Would you give her OxyContin? Would you give her Vinza? Would you give her Exalgo? Would you give her Methadone? Would you give her transdermal fentanyl? Would you think about sending her to a doctor? <laughs> what would you do? You're there. You're on the front lines. You have a prescription pad. It comes from the state of New York. There's a DEA number. You don't know why they gave that to you, but there it is. <laughs> There's a DEA number. You could write anything you want on that piece of paper. Hand it to the patient. She'll go to a pharmacy. Likely it's just you'll have an opioid at the end of the day. You really would like her not to die tonight. You would like that. So many hours at the depositions. You hate that. So what are you going to do? What are you going to prescribe? Opioid naive patient with chronic, moderate to severe pain. Other things have been tried. You risk stratify her as a reasonable risk. Maybe not zero. Maybe she has a history of alcoholism in the past. Maybe she has a, like my patient, uh, three uh, primary relatives with histories of drug abuse. But you say, in this context, I'm willing to do this trial. Monitor the outcome, see how you do. So what are you going to give her? Are you going to give her short acting or long acting? No reason. There's no evidence one way or the other. So many people would have, a, have as a standard approach, a routine approach, to always start the, sh the, the opioid naive patient on a short acting drug because it's easier to titrate. And also if they have trouble with toxicity, the time required to get the drug out of the body is shorter. That's the only justification. It's not a strong justification. So deciding to start the patient on a 12 mic patch is one of the reasons that the 12 mic patch was finally created by the manufacturer 10 years after the Duragesic product was released, right? Because there was a call from the community, we can't start our patients on 25, right? So you could decide in this context of chronic pain, I'm going to try a 12 mic patch. It would be fine. I probably myself would give her a short-acting drug like Vicodin or Percocet. I would probably even, in an elderly woman, I probably would give her the Percocet that had the 2.5 milligrams of oxycodone in it. Just because I'm, you never know. You know, someone's opioid naive, you just never know. I had a colleague who still um, is the chair of, of neurology at LIJ now, who had a patient who had a respiratory arrest after taking 30 milligrams of codeine. And and he didn't believe it. So he gave the patient 30 milligrams of codeine again in a monitored environment, and the patient had a respiratory arrest again. So this is one in a million, you know, but the reality is that everybody's different. But no problem. So, so we have um, one possibility would be doing a low dose of a long-acting drug. So what are the options? Transdermal fentanyl, 12 mics. Oxycontin, what dose? 10 BID. 10 BID. What else? MS Contin or generic MS Contin or Avinza or Cadian. These are the long acting, either 12 hour, 24 hour morphine formulations in what total daily dose? 15 BIDs. 20 or 30 for 24 hours, either 15 BID or a Vinza could be either 20 or 30 once a day. Good. Long-acting hydromorphone. Do we have a long-acting hydromorphone in the market called Exalgo? What dose? Too high. So maybe eight. Very low, right? Right, if eight of hydromorphone is roughly equivalent to 10 of morphine IV, roughly equivalent to 30 of morphine PO, 8 of exalgo is roughly equal to the morphine of 30 you wanted to give her. What about um, Opana, oxymorphone? Do we have an Opana ER, a long-acting long oxymorphone? Okay, so what's the potency of oxymorphone relative to morphine? Right, about twice as potent as morphine. So how, what dose would you give? 5 or 10. I probably would give 5, but that's okay. 
10 BID is probably fine. Okay, good. Now, what about uh, methadone? Would you ever start methadone in this situation? How old is the patient again? Say it again. How old is the patient? 150. <laughs> 71. So, so the answer is, well, methadone can be an extraordinarily useful drug as a primary analgesic, but in general, based on accumulated uh, clinical experience, its real utility seems to be on opioid rotation when the potency of the drug gets to be much higher than you'd expect based on the typical equal analgesic dose tables. So methadone may be considered by some people to be the a very good second or third line drug in opioid rotation. Not such a favorable first line drug because you don't gain any added benefits relative to the other drugs and it's harder to give because it's got a long and variable half-life, takes more monitoring. So you have to monitor it more and you don't gain anything in terms of potency relative to the equi-analgesic dose table as you do in opioid rotation. So many people would say methadone is a first line, no. But there are provisos, like for anything else. It's dirt cheap. So you have a patient who's uninsured and is a responsible drug user and would allow you to monitor the drug carefully. Methadone is great. They will be so grateful at the cost of methadone. They won't believe it when they take 100 tablets away from the pharmacy. They won't believe what it costs. But what dose are you going to give? Opioid. Gram and a half? For an opioid knife. Right. Good. So there's t a couple of ways to do that, um, to use methadone because of its long and variable half-life. Some people pr prefer, strongly prefer starting PRN. So the dose then would be 2.5 Q4, Q6 PRN, and you see what the patient needs. I don't, I don't do that myself. I like a fixed scheduled regimen with um, starting at a very low dose and then titrating weekly. So I would probably do 2.5 QID unless the patient is very elderly, which would be 2.5 TID. What about Butrans? Everybody know what Butrans is? Butrans, B-U-T-R-A-N-S. Right, just on the market. Just on the market, you guys are so lucky. It took me 30 years to get to prescribe Butrans. You can do it this year. Butrans, but transdermal buprenorphine. Very popular in some European countries for this context. Opioid naive patients with chronic, moderate to severe pain. So Butrans is extremely low dose relative to Suboxone and Subutec orally. So it's 5, 10, or 20 mics per hour. So in an opioid naive patient, the company would want you to start with 5 or 10. Very low dose. Okay? Okay, so those are your choices for long-acting. Short-acting, Percocet, Tylenol number three. What do you all think about, what do you all think about codeine relative to oxycodone or hydrocodone? It's not very potent. Potency, so you know, you understand potency, right? So potency is the dose required to get a given effect. In pain management, we generally don't care about potency because we adjust the dose. We care about efficacy and maximal efficacy. We don't usually care about potency. The only time you really care about potency is when you have to go up very high to get the effect and the number of tablets or the cost becomes very high. Sometimes we care about potency because there's a disconnect between analgesia and side effects and as you go up on a drug, the therapeutic index gets worse. That's probably why codeine's got a bad rap. So, so, I, would, so I would say the, the reason for not preferring codeine is not potency. What about metabolism? No. Well, unpredictable why I'm going to torture you because I can. Right, 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 right. So somewhere between 7 and 10% of Caucasian patients don't respond to coding. Don't respond to coding, right? Because they are, they don't, is codeine, a, is codeine an opioid or a pro, codeine is a prodrug. It's converted to morphine. 
right, at, at CYP 2D6, right? And 2D6 is a very variable isozyme. There are ultra-rapid metabolizers, rapid metabolizers, ordinary metabolizers, and slow metabolizers. So if you are a slow metabolizer, it's about 10% of white, pe about 10 of white people in the U.S., you don't convert morphine, court coding to morphine well, and consequently you get less analgesia. So, there, there, so that's the real reason that some people don't prefer coding. But again, it's so cheap. You know, you can give people Opana, but it's expensive. You can give people, I can't hear you. Okay. So starting a drug, lots of choices. It's good for you all to be thoughtful. Starting a long acting drug is a decision. You just have to be able to defend it. And you know, I think in the patient I described, it's very defensible. Selecting the right drug is really, um, selecting a drug and knowing how, what dose to select of a long acting in particular is important because once they put it in their mouth or put it on their skin, they're stuck for a while. You know, so if they get quite sick from it, they got a long way to go. Um, and as I said, if, if you had as a default position, that all patients relatively opioid naive get a short acting drug for a while, which is what I've come to do over years just out of my own comfort level. That's fine, that's, that's perfectly within standard of care too. Okay, so you've selected the drug. What's the root? You guys have already said what the root is. Oral or transdermal, right? And transdermal root, the, is there any advantage to the transdermal root? Whoa, relative to oral, I mean. So, have you seen the pharmacokinetics of Avinza? So, or, or Butrans? Butrans is a seven day patch. So, you get blood levels like poof. Avinza is like this. So, you might say, well, I'm comparing transdermal fentanyl to OxyContin. And I'd say, okay, there's certainly a difference between this and this. However, comparing transdermal fentanyl to some of the other long-acting drugs in terms of the stability of the plasma concentration is, uh, doesn't give you an advantage. And the other question, of course, is does, do you need stable blood levels to do well, right? And since no, no controlled trial, trial has ever demonstrated that people do better with a long-acting than a short-acting, did you know that? In, when the evidence-based guidelines of the American Pain Society and the American Academy of Pain Medicine came out, one of the um, ancillary papers that got written was about the evidence base for choosing long-acting drugs. And guess what? There isn't any. So there's no evidence that you can't do fabulously well by having patients on short-acting drugs. It's just a matter of how they dose it, right? In most cases. Anyway, bottom line is, it's not because of the stability of plasma concentration. When would you, when would you perceive a potential advantage to a transdermal formulation? My patient can swallow. Right, so GI tract is uh, relatively unavailable. Either they can't swallow, they have malabsorption syndrome. <coughs> and as part of that, there are three large surveys to suggest that the constipating effects of opioids are less when administered systemically than orally. So <clears throat> you could argue about whether those surveys represent strong enough evidence to say as a conclusion that transdermal or systemically administered drugs are less constipating than oral drugs. You can argue about it, but the bottom line is it has appeared in multiple surveys and is sort of generally accepted. Is there any difference in terms of um, addiction potential? No. However, <clears throat> there is a difference in terms of liking. So addiction is very complicated, right? Because addiction, the rate of addiction, and by addiction we're talking about the disease of addiction, right? We're talking about people who lose control of their opioid, they have compulsive use, they continue to use despite harm, they experience craving, they, they get into a downward spiral, right? So addiction is not abuse. So when you ask, so the question has to be framed. So if you're saying, is there any difference, any evidence that oxycodone causes biologically predisposed patients to develop the disease, the clinical disease of addiction, more than fentanyl does? 
Or is there any evidence, for example, that morphine is more likely to cause relapse in patients who are in recovery than is oxycodone? There is no evidence of that. But having said that, drugs have different street values. So there's different liking, so-called liking, of drugs by the addict community who are engaged in diverting the drugs. So oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydromorphone are very popular on the streets. Transdermal fentanyl is very unpopular. Now why is that? And no one knows. It's not, people don't believe it's because one's more addictive and one's less addictive. It's something more about the context, something more about the social reinforcers, something about the cost. Now there may be some differences. There was a study, for example, in college students that suggested that oxycodone produces more of a buzz, a euphoric type buzz, than does morphine. So that's may, there may be drug-specific differences. It's never been confirmed in patients, though. So, it's, so I don't want to be glib and say, no, there are differences that you need to know about. So for example, if you have a patient with a personal history of opioid addiction who's in recovery, <coughs> but you're a little concerned that the recovery is tenuous, particularly because the patient's still engaged in social interactions in a community of people who are abusing, right? So you say, I wanna help you, I wanna give you an opioid, but frankly, I'm concerned because you hang out with people who are using drugs and your recovery doesn't seem that secure to me, frankly. So you build in a lot of, uh, a lot of controls into your prescribing small doses. They have to come back and pick it up. They have to do a pill count. You do a urine drug screen every time they come. That particular patient also wouldn't get oxycodone, hydromorphone, or oxymorphone for me. That patient would either get methadone, buprenorphine, or transdermal fentanyl because it's less liked on the street. Yeah, it does. I didn't mention it. It does go here. Um, you know, the decision making here is really about constipation or GI dysfunction in the decision to use a, a non-oral route versus an oral route. The decision about specific drugs here, um, what you brought up is a very, is an important point, particularly in this environment. I mean, I think if you're in the middle of Oklahoma, it's probably less likely to be an issue. However, if you're in the middle of Appalachia, big issue. You know, so you have to, these are very important. I mean, I, you know, 10 years ago, who thought of this stuff? I mean, it just never crossed my mind as I was given bucketfuls of opioids, you know. Here, here's a bucket of OxyContin. Good luck to you. You know, okay, but now, you know, I'm, uh, most of my, the patients that I still treat, most of them are on um, very large doses of opioids. So I literally write prescriptions for, you know, uh, two grams of oxycodone a day. I have to be real secure that that person is not in an environment where someone's going to reach and just say, I'll just take a gram today, you know, because this stuff happens. Okay. So we already talked about selecting the initial dose in the opioid naive patient. Suppose the patient's taking OxyContin, 80 milligrams TID, comes in and says, my pain is terrible. You do an assessment, you find out the patient's been a responsible drug user, but the pain is terrible. So you have, with respect to the opioid therapy specifically, you have several choices. Choice number one is to ignore it. Choice number two is to increase it. Choice number three is to change it. Choice number four is to stop it. I can't think of any more choices. I guess you could lower it, but you, then you'd be a sadist, and <laughs> unless you have a separate certificate in sadism, a subspecialty in that area, it's not really what I think you do, right? So someone's taking 80 milligrams of OxyContin three times a day. They come in for their chronic low back pain, and they say, my pain is terrible. And you know them now for several months, and you do an assessment of their drug-taking behavior, you do an assessment of their function, and you make a clinical judgment that they're not functioning well because they have terrible pain, even though they're taking the drug you're prescribing in a responsible way. And I hope that that is the overwhelming majority of patients you treat with opioids. It has been in my experience. 
So what do you do? The choices are stop the drug, don't touch the drug and do something else, increase the drug, or change the drug. Who would stop the drug? Who would leave the drug the same and do something else? Who would increase the dose? Who would change the drug? So the standard of care generally now would be to increase the dose because there's a concept cause, called opioid responsiveness. And, that, and the concept of opioid responsiveness says that the patient's response to an opioid regimen cannot be determined until the dose is titrated to treatment limiting toxicity. If a patient comes in and says, I tried oxy, this happens all the time, you may hear it today. A patient comes in and says, I tried OxyContin, it didn't work. Then your next question should be, what do you mean it didn't work? And then the patient says, I had terrible pain on it. And then you say, did you have any side effects? And if the patient says no, then you don't know if the patient is poorly responsive to OxyContin or merely had an insufficient uh, trial. Right? So in this case, patient's taking 80 milligrams of OxyContin three times a day, says pain is terrible. Your choices are to stop the drug, ignore the drug, increase the drug, and or switch the drug. Half of you said to, to switch the drug, half of you said to increase the drug. The key answer to the question, are you having side effects? No one asked me. So I assumed that you all knew that she wasn't having any side effects. And so with the, in the absence of side effects, you would increase the drug. With side effects, you might consider switching the drug. Later on in the year, we'll have a lecture about re opioid responsiveness, and we'll talk about strategies for opioid responsiveness. The pain docs will love this because it actually includes a category of intervention. But in terms of r rotating the drug, so patients on OxyContin, 80 milligrams TID, you've decided to switch the drug. What drug are you going to switch to? Why? It's a lot of morphine, similar, but another long-acting opioid. It's another long-acting opioid. So long opioid, right. So in other words, you probably have a pen in your pocket that says Katie and in a coffee cup. <laughs> and... Uh, and yeah, went to dinner the night before. Katie and Ref is really attractive. <laughs> These are the important medical. I can't believe I just said that on film. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I do realize that some of this can be edited out. Okay, so um, you said that the the um, it's another long-acting drug, and then you shrugged to imply. I'm basically just doing it trial and error. Am I interpreting that right? Okay. So that's the correct response because uh, there, is, there are very few guidelines for opioid rotation. Basically, the studies that have been out there are large observational studies that suggest that the next trial is more likely to work than not, but the next trial could be anything. Some people would say methadone is a spe specific case because the switch to methadone may be associated with unanticipated increased potency of methadone, so you can use a low dose. And in some cases, the anecdotal data out there would suggest that methadone may have a better maximal efficacy in patients who are on another drug. So some people would prefer methadone as a second drug, or they'd wait until the third line or fourth line, but this would be where you might consider methadone. Uh, you probably uh, would consider butrans uh, because there's very little data that starting buprenorphine so low produces withdrawal. Remember, buprenorphine is a partial agonist, and if you give that drug to a patient who is physically dependent on a pure agonist, you get withdrawal, but there's a dose effect. So it, the, the company has chosen such small doses in butrans that they really have not seen uh, um, induced withdrawal. So it's okay to switch to, and the, and the package insert tells you how to do it. So it's okay to switch to buprenorphine. You wouldn't want to switch to high-dose buprenorphine like Suboxone because you'll, do, you'll get into withdrawal just like the addiction docs do when they put people on buprenorphine for addiction, right? But in any case, you could, so you can choose any drug at all. Choosing morphine is fine. Choosing Opana is fine. Choosing methadone is fine. Transdermal fentanyl is fine. They're all fine. So how do you, how do you switch the drug? What are the what are the guidelines? You probably are all aware that two years ago, a, consensus, a national consensus committee came together and published new guidelines. 
And you probably are aware of that because Dr. Chrissy and I, Ani and I did that. We created new guidelines published in the Journal of Pain. But the guidelines are basically what they've always been. The equianalgesic dose table, which, did you all get that tattoo yet put on your body? <laughs> Not yet? Okay, soon. So you'll all have the equianalgesic dose table tattooed on your body soon. The equianalgesic dose table, this is an important take home message, so here we go. Very important to remember that the equianalgesic dose table was created by Ray Hood and Ada Rogers at Sloan Kettering to reflect the best science that was available concerning um, a switch from one drug to another, concerning equianalgesic doses. The best science that was available was science that was performed in populations that were relatively opioid naive, were disproportionately Caucasian, mostly had cancer, and the doses that were selected were mostly low. Right? So Dr. Hood, who uh, was one of my mentors and unbelievable, terrific guy, really, uh, I mean, the equianalgesic dose table did not appear like from a mountain, right? Somebody sat down and did the studies and then wrote the table. That was Dr. Hood and his nurse, Ada Rogers. So um, that equianalgesic dose table, which has largely stood the test of time with some changes, right? The, the first equianalgesic dose table had morphine, 60 milligrams PO equal 10 of IV. Now it all says 20 to 30 because of some additional data. But the equianalgesic dose table still says that methadone and morphine are equipotent, even though we know that when you switch to methadone, you get an unanticipated high potency that can kill people, right? So the equianalgesic dose table reflects the science from what's called relative potency assays that define equianalgesic doses as best evidence. If you would use the equianalgesic table as is, I can guarantee you that you will hurt people very badly. Right? The equianalgesic dose table cannot be used without clinical adjustment. Like all evidence, right? Evidence is, evidence is just what's created in well-designed clinical trials that may or may not have anything to do with the patient in front of you. Depends on who went into the trial, what the methodology was, what they decided to assess, how long it was, the treatment was. So the equianalgesic dose table is the first step. So you want to switch from OxyContin, 240 milligrams a day to morphine. So you look at the equianalgesic dose table and you say, what is the ratio? What is the amount of morphine equal to 240 milligrams of, uh, of oxycodone a day? And you find out that morphine is a little bit more potent, a little bit less potent than oxycodone. So 240 milligrams a day is equal to about 360 milligrams of oral morphine. Then you, conduct, then you look at the world's best article on opioid rotation and you say, now what do I do? So step one is to reduce the, reduce the equianalgesic dose by a standard amount because there is incomplete cross-tolerance to drug. We'll talk more about what that means, but when you read about it, if you do read about it um, after this lecture, it just basically means that you can't be assured that when patients have been taking a drug for a time, the effect of switching the drug won't be, high, won't be unanticipatedly strong because of incomplete cross-tolerance. There's not complete cross-tolerance to uh, analgesic effects or side effects. So if a person has less than full cross-tolerance to a side effect, they'll get a side effect when you don't anticipate it. So to take, because there's a lot of variation among people and because we, don't, we can't feel secure about incomplete cross-tolerance, there's a standard reduction. The standard reduction is 25 to 50% for all drugs except methadone and transdermal fentanyl. For methadone, the, the standard reduction is what? Anybody know? 75 to 90, 75 to 90. 75 if it's a relatively low dose, 90 if it's a high dose. And for transdermal fentanyl, we usually don't take a standard reduction. We don't take a standard reduction. There's historical reasons for that. Then, so now you've calculated the equianalgesic dose, 360 milligrams. You've reduced it by 50%. You're down to 180 milligrams of morphine. Now there's a second step built into the guideline. And the second step is a clinical adjustment based on the assessment of the patient's risk and pain. 
and it's we've we taught we decided in the committee that it would be 15% up or 15% down right standard reduction and then a second step 15% up or 15% down from there 15% up if they have bad pain 15% down if they're very frail right in the middle if they both have bad pain and they're frail <laughs> right you notice how this was created by doctors for doctors you know what I'm saying? just follow the instructions you'll be okay so and that's the story so the patient was taking 240 of oxycontin you calculated 360 you cut it by 50 percent you're down to 180 uh, she's uh, let's just say she's uh, uh, 90 pounds and frail so you reduce the 180 by another 15 percent or so that's like another what 30 milligrams you're down to 150 so you could start her on a Vinza 150 once a day or start her on MS Contin uh, 60 milligrams uh, I guess you'd have to do 60 milligrams and 90 milligrams okay and that's the strategy so you could pick any drug you want including methadone and just apply the rules and if you apply the rules the likelihood of hurting people is very low that's why the rules were created because if you start with the analgesic dose table and you don't apply the rules, you will definitely hurt people. If you, start the, if you use the analgesic dose table and you dose with methadone, you will kill people. That's a true fact. I almost killed one person with methadone years and years ago. And if that person did not have a son who was a medical student at that time, he would have died overnight. And, um, you know, and I would have gone to court and I would have found experts to say that I dosed appropriately but it really wasn't so you know I did not I didn't do the second step you know I cut back 75 percent when I should have cut back 90 percent and I didn't cut back an additional 15 percent even though he was a COPD -er who was old so even that that 75 percent was too high for him and his res respiratory rate went down to four and he was found by his son and his son stupidly didn't call 911 the son just walked him up and down the house for four hours seriously and then called me the next morning, calm and mature, and said, you know, my dad was really sleeping, was breathing at four last night, so I had to walk him so that he kept breathing. I kept on saying, breathe, dad, breathe. I, and he said, I think he's having a reaction to the methadone. Meanwhile, I needed resuscitation. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that close. That close. I clearly, that, that poor man would have... So you definitely will kill people without if you don't follow the rules for opioid rotation with respect to methadone. Okay, so we didn't talk about opioid responsiveness and dose titration. I am actually given another hour with you to talk about side effect management, which I enjoy doing, and the, and the monitoring outcomes we actually talked about at the last lecture in terms of the four A's. Right, great. Someone was going to say Z's, and I was going, no, no. That's... Uh, another thing happening during the lecture. But the four A's, right? Analgesia, adverse effects or side effects, activities or functionality, and aberrant drug-related behavior, or whether or not patients responsible drug use. So you're monitoring the four A's for both risk and pharmacotherapy, uh, pharmacological outcomes, and then you make decisions along the way. So I think we got, we got through most everything that I wanted to say except how to titrate. So um, in some contexts later on, We'll talk about that. And then the only other thing I want you to make sure, anybody here who wants to make sure of this could make sure of this, and that is um, there are some techniques to you that, that I consider to be uh, um, sort of uh, um, more sophisticated, more consistent with specialist level competencies when using opioids. For example, rapid titration approaches for people with very severe pain. And I would like all of you to finish the year having those techniques under your belt. So at some point, at some point either the next time we do a, a conference or during a case conference, um, you know, feel free to talk to me about or ask me to talk to you about how you do rapid titration approaches. Because one of the, one of the very bad mistakes that people make when they're titrating is to be rigidly in a box sort of divorced from where the person is in terms of pain. And so, you know, if you have a patient, if you're going to titrate, if you, suppose you have a patient with very severe pain, you start the patient on transdermal fentanyl. 
So you know that it takes the patient 24 to 48 hours to reach a pseudo steady state to see what that dose is. And we typically titrate 72 hours to 72 hours because most people will reach that, that pseudo steady state at 72 hours. So let's say you, you pick a dose that's one third or one quarter of what that person ultimately will need. So you've just consigned that person to 12 days of terrible pain because you've decided to follow a strategy that would be appropriate for moderate to severe pain or pain that's okay if you sit, but severe unrelenting pain, if it were me, don't make me wait 12 days. Right? So you need, to have, you need to have sort of these other strategies that can be used when the clinical context calls for it. Okay, any questions or comments for me?